Hi, I'm Michael Woods, the chief scientist at the Asian Turfgrass Center. This is the ATC Double Cut, where I give some extra attention. I give a double cut treatment to something that I've written about on the ATC website. Today, I'm going to be talking with a special guest about a post on the website that is very interesting to me and very interesting to my guest, I believe I would like to introduce and welcome Dr. Frank Rossi to the show. Hello, Frank. Hello, Micah. I am glad to have you. This is your first time as a guest on the ATC Double Cut. I have been a guest on your, uh, frankly speaking, podcast a few times on TurfNet. So it's, it's a pleasure to have you here. I'm happy to be here. And uh, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, I didn't write out all of Dr. Rossi's, um, uh, what would you say, job title, because he sent me, a, when I invited him on the show, we did that by email, and I checked his email signature, and it's one of the longer email signatures, uh, so he's a, uh, a Richard C. Call Director of the Agricultural Sciences major at Cornell University, the New York State Extension Turfgrass Specialist and an Associate Professor of Horticulture in the Integrated School of Plant Science, which I couldn't really fit on the screen. But you, I think of you as a turfgrass guy, but you're, uh, yeah, you're a university professor and, and that sort of thing, I guess. One of the things that's great about being in academics, and certainly academics have changed over the years, is that it does provide not necessarily more financial rewards, more opportunities for intellectual change in, you know, direction of research and teaching. And I've really availed myself, Micah, uh, of a lot of things that academics have offered outside of TURF, because as you know, from being with us, TURF isn't at Cornell what it is at Michigan State, it, at Ohio State, at NC State. It is a agricultural college in an Ivy League university, and that has enormous influence on the um, way we approach our work, the sort that we take when we start asking questions. Yes, it does. And I had the opportunity to study with Dr. Rossi when I was a graduate student. And I went there in August of 2001, and I was there for four and a half years where I studied with Dr. Rossi. And the blog post that I'm going to talk about, I'm going to put a direct link to this in the description uh, or in the show notes. It's a blog that I did a couple weeks ago, and I gave it the title of the least enjoyable experiment ever. And this is Dr. Rossi's experiment, but so, you know, it was 20 years ago. And somehow, I was a graduate student. I had been a golf course superintendent. And I, so I'd been a golf course superintendent prior to going to graduate school. And I go to Cornell and I go to graduate school and I've got all these classes. I've got, you know, 600 level statistics classes and uh, ion and water transport in plants. And I was taking some foreign language classes and soil chemistry and uh, soils of the tropics, a, a relatively heavy course load and adapting to that big change of going from being a golf course superintendent to all of a sudden being a graduate student at an Ivy League institution. It was a lot for me to handle and doing my own experiment. And then Frank said, Micah, I've got this product study of all these different fertilizer programs, and we've got a lot of products to mix up. Can you help me out with, with weighing out and measuring out the treatments? And I call it the least enjoyable experiment ever because this went on for years and years. And I think it must have been less enjoyable for Dr. Rossi than it was for me because I eventually got out of that. And I don't remember exactly how I got out of it, but I think I complained and I just said, it's not a good use of my time to be weighing out products for two or three hours on a, on a, Tuesday so that the treatments can be made on a Wednesday um, because it was just mind numbing. And I want to talk a little bit about this experiment with you because that's my memory of it. And the other big memory that I have of it 
is that urea, the treatment with urea, potassium sulfate, and ferrous sulfate was just as good as any of the fancy designer fertilizer treatments. And so... Okay, okay. So so um, that was... Let me unpack a little bit about what you said. First off, um, not only were you in an academic stimulated, in, you know, a stimulating academic environment, you were there with Professor Doug Soldat and Professor Zach Easton, two pretty smart guys uh, as well. And I can say really comfortably that was an enormously, um, you know, invigorating academic period in, in my career. So while you were grinding on it, um, you know, this was also, you know, mid career for me. So we were full steam. We had lots of grad students and really stimulating environment. And um, so that's the first part. Second part is, um, as you know, uh, back then, um, a lot of products were coming to market because golf was a, uh, a large economic engine. We were building golf courses still before the crash and before 9-11 when you came, building golf courses at a, a record pace, right? And the money being spent there was uh, unfathomable on things that I believe you and the nature of, can you hear me? I, I can hear you. I can hear you. This is okay. So this is okay. either getting recorded on the server and it's going to sound okay, or it's going to be unusable. So I'm going to find out after we're done talking. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, uh, we wanted to, because of your interest in nutrition and my interest in making sure people were more sustainable, which is not using things they don't necessarily need. Um, we embarked upon this uh, question of, it was just simply, a, you know, a, like a spray and pray product thing. It just was early on and it was um, comprehensive. We looked at a lot of different companies. We went to them and said, tell us what you want to spray. We'll spray it exactly the way you want it, exactly what you want it. And as you my products, as you, I don't have to, you don't have to imagine, you weighed out uh, some treatments that had 10 products in them and other treatments that had two. So um, it was a simple question and it had a lot of uh, aspects to it. Your aspect was the field component. We also took these solutions and gave them to Lucia Tyler in the analytical chemistry lab and analyzed uh, their ingredients with one, you know, simple question. Is this any better than urea and iron? And it, and the reason why I'm bringing up a experiment from 20 years ago in 2022, I'm wondering the reason, myself. right? So the reason why Frank is because for the past year or so, I've been fielding questions from turf grass managers, and it goes something like this: I've heard that people can weigh out and, and dissolve their own urea and apply it. How do I do that? Where do I buy it? And these are golf course superintendents. And they'll be like, I just took over. Um, I've, I've been an assistant. My old superintendent used really expensive products. I've been following what you're doing. How do I do this? And they don't know where to buy it. They don't know how to do it. And they don't know how it's possible. And and so I tried to direct them to some uh, superintendents in the area, in, in their country or in their state, who might be able to give them some practical advice. But I realize there's people that don't know that this is possible. Then I've been trying to share a little bit of information about this so that people can get answers to those questions. And I've recorded with Andrew McDaniel a podcast where we went over one of the blog posts where he was spending a small amount of money on MPK. Well, just N and K he's using urea and potassium sulfate and hosting a professional tournament. It's working great. And then some people listen to that and they're like, wow, thank you so much. I did not know that was possible. These are also people at the assistant and superintendent level. So I realize, and I mean, this is as recently as, as six weeks ago, 
Okay, I, I'm getting that kind of feedback. So I'm like, okay, a lot of people are concerned about fertilizer cost. A lot of people are concerned about getting really good results. And some people apparently don't realize that if you want to, you can use urea and get identical. I, I would say you maybe even have more control and, and it's, it's an even more precision approach to get uh, the perfect turf grass conditions. And I remember this experiment and this experiment, as I recall, used all the name brands at the time. It had Grig Brothers, it had Florentine, it has Plant Foods, it had Emerald Isle, it's got Helena, a, a, all 16 different treatments. And those companies got to, as you mentioned, they got to say what the program was. They got to say, okay, you provided them with the soil test. You said, this is Pen G2. Here's how we're maintaining it. Here's the soil test. They got to design the program and say, here's what our program is. You had different spray volumes. You had soil sprays. You had, uh, what are those? Leafs, fo foliar sprays? Yeah, right. You had everything. No, no I heard if I hear soil spray, if I, I think my head's going to explode. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think don't understand maybe the my soil spray thing. There's things you water in, and there's honestly, I wouldn't, other than iron, that I want to stain. Other than iron, I can't think of a nutrient I wouldn't water in. What about you? Um, I think for convenience, I will just leave the nutrients on the leaf and water it in whenever I run some irrigation because I'm applying it yeah. at such a low rate that, uh, it's not going to burn. So, I mean, I just think of like, I just spray it out. Some of it goes in the leaf. Some of it goes in the soil. So. I recall that we had all this data and I looked up your article. You had an article in the green section record in 2004 or 2005 that summarized the first year of the experiment. Then you had the article in golf course management magazine, I believe in 2006 that summarized three years of the experiment. And when I read both of those articles earlier this month, and again, this afternoon, I realized they don't, um, they don't, they don't make a really powerful statement that just like urea and monoammonium phosphate and potassium sulfate and ferrous sulfate were equal to any of the other treatments, basically. And, and actually, uh, basically, they beat every other treatment except for one. And I think part of that might have been because of potential yeah. lawsuits or because of those companies were so difficult to deal with when they saw what the results were. And, and because when I read that, it's like, it's trying to say, well, it depends, or maybe this could be good in a certain situation. But I was there and I saw that year after year, cause that experiment was right next to my potassium experiment. And I saw what treatments were looking the best and the, the control treatment, which was you called the traditional fertilizer, which is, urea, monoammonium phosphate, potassium sulfate, and ferrous sulfate was equal in quality to the best treatments for pretty much most of the time. So I looked up the data, reanalyzed it on my blog, and, and then I called it the least enjoyable experiment ever because of my time spent with that mind-numbing weighing and measuring out. And I think for you, it might have been the least enjoyable experiment ever uh, it, just with having to deal with the companies that believe in their products, think that their products are the best in the world, and then somebody does an experiment with a control treatment that's reasonable, and all of a sudden, uh, they didn't like the results. Okay, let me try to unpack some of that now. Um, uh, I will say, um, you know, the data showed that there was more than 50% of the time when the traditional program um, was acceptable. And I think you have to also realize, and I didn't do this, that even if 50% of the time it wasn't, it was always acceptable. It rarely ever, during the entire course of the experiment, didn't provide, you know, really good play, you know, really good quality. It may not have provided the best quality, 
but it generally provided really good quality without any consideration of economics. Now, the USGA did a little bit of a job on this. I think they caught the wind of this. And then, you know, you saw Adam Miller, Miller doing this a while ago, you know, how to really look at co- uh, fertilizer costs and what you're getting out of that. So, so that's the one thing. The funny thing that it probably doesn't show up anywhere, and since you're asking me and you want to double cut it, I'll tell you. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons that I wasn't, you were correct in that there was potential liability issues with me and my mouth. <laughs> and I got a few from some of the companies. Um, and it was uh, an enlightening, um, it was an enlightening experience, but it did help me develop, you know, a lot of relationships with these people in the industry. Um, and I will say this. There were a couple of things that we found notable: seaweed and nutrients. Right? They looked like they were doing better than others. Mm-hmm. Um, the Nutramax, the shark cartilage stuff, um, actually, that laid some of the foundation for Gordy Kaufman's PhD work that he went on to do at Waddington. And then turned that into a career with Griggs because, you know, um, uh, not I'm sorry, not wanting to watch. He worked with Tom. I misspoke there. He went and worked with Tom Watchkey and, um, and 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 looked at these amino acids and how these things behave. And I think he found some uh, very interesting results. So let me say this. Let me say the, the fervor with which everybody was trying to sell these things right to people to make money and sort of make people uh, think these things were really necessary, blinded some people to actually some of the hidden gems that might have been in here. And those were uh, two of them that that I can recall very clearly because they've continued to come up a lot in my entire career. And the same for plant food. Plant food then took some of the things that they found with us and some of the anthracnose data that we were able to find in some other work and some of their nutritional programs that they use um, in the Rutgers trial, and they have specific nutrient programs, um, you know, that they recommend for anthracnose. Now, all that said, I fundamentally still felt like, boy, if you get enough nitrogen and iron on there, you're probably going to have pretty good looking turf. It's literally shocking to me to hear from you that people didn't know they could melt urea. As you know, Dave Hicks was doing this when he showed up in the late 90s uh, at Cornell. I mean, this is how we fertigate to a certain extent that we are able to melt these well, things. But, but I, but I think, I think the big lead here, I think the, the, um, the product, you know, the, the fertilizer industry has done a really good job in obfuscating the truth here, both with soil testing uh, that sort of creates uh, deficiencies that are not there as your MLSN has highlighted. And you know, the Michigan state work recently and, and um, they've, I think, um, I think you've s- distracted people. I think they've distracted uh, folks from the simplicity that nutrition can be. So. And, well, thank you, Frank, for unpacking that very, very well. And I just want to show one summary in this blog post, which you can get a direct link to. I'll also put a link to Frank's Green Section Record and uh, Golf Course Management uh, magazine articles uh, that that summarized the experiment and provided some of that additional detail. Uh, when I, I analyzed this, so I looked up the data for each date and I counted for every treatment. There were there were sixteen treatments, but some of them changed. So I think I I looked at thirteen uh, programs or thirteen treatments that were this that were roughly the same through the three years of the experiment. And out of those, the traditional fertilizer program was in the top statistical group on 14 out of 28 dates. So that's half the time that it was in the uh, top statistical treatment. And there was only one program that did better, which was the traditional program with the EcoGuard added. And then everything else was worse. So it was basically, if you look at it, over three years, it was the second highest ranking uh, treatment. Which yeah. I just, uh, I reanalyzed it and just looked at that. How many times was it in the top statistical group for every 
And, and so we look at some of those other name brand programs, instead of being in the top statistical group 14 out of 28 times, they're like five times, six times out of a, a large number of sampling dates over the years. So that's a way, because it's quite complicated statistically to uh, look at that, especially when the treatments change. Which unfortunately they did, which is why this um, doesn't get published just in add, crop science. Yeah. <laughs> the company's a chance to adapt. I didn't really want to give anyone an excuse that somehow we didn't do this right. So I, I chatted with um, a colleague who's still a colleague and a friend now at Consumer Reports when we were starting this work. You know, Consumer Union is based in Yonkers, New York, and we've done mower and there's... So I asked them about sort of how to deal with this, but I want to go back to this data that you're showing here, Mike. Mm -hmm. We use, you know, flea in the quality world as acceptable. And, and if you look at this uh, over a three year period, you see that the, maybe in July of 04, the control fell below six, like you know, all the other treatments did. But the way mm -hmm. I look at it is I just want to check this, off. If I'm a golf course superintendent, I want to look at this and say, what's the least expensive? What's very effective? And simplify it down to the nuts and bolts. Because as you know, we've done deep dives on this stuff for 20 years, as has many other people. And we are not distracted by all these other things that we think we might need and try to keep this simple. Now, I haven't listened to what you said with Andrew, but I, it's, I don't know why it seems, I need you to explain to me why is a surprise that people are surprised they could spend less money on fertilizer? I don't know. You, you remember that excellent green section record article by, uh, and I think it has the title, the very exciting title of turf grass fertilization. It is by Brian Whitlark and Blake Benton Meyer. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that they wrote that about five years ago and actually it's in my, it's in my Twitter. I schedule tweets in uh, a software called buffer and it's in my queue to share that article. I think tomorrow, um, unless I share this, uh, this double cut in, in lieu of that. So anyway, we'll see, but that will be shared soon. And that one, they had the, uh, they used their economic case study of that golf course in Las Vegas with bent grass greens that was spending $90,000 a year on liquid fertilizer. And they make an 82% savings by dropping it down to uh, $12,000 or something. And then, and then I think, gosh, 12,000 is a lot of money to spend on uh, four acres of bent grass or, or whatever it was. Um, because you can do it for a fraction of that. So if you're wanting to save money, and it's just like, what value are, if you're getting value from that, that's, I just care about the results. I, I usually don't talk about products, about specific products, and I usually don't talk about cost because I just assume that everybody knows. But I feel I kind of have a duty to explain it every now and then because apparently some people don't know. So what we're, what I would say is, your baseline is urea because urea is the cheapest nitrogen source always. So your baseline is the, the conditions that you can get applying urea and potassium sulfate. For example, presumably most places with the sand root zone are going to eventually need potassium fertilizer. So typically you're going to be looking at a mix of urea and potassium sulfate. That's your lowest cost unless you want to use potassium chloride, which will work pretty well too, just a slightly higher salt index. So you're, but usually uh, potassium sulfate is a low cost. So you're looking at urea, potassium sulfate, that's going to cost you something like uh, 800 US dollars, 1500 US dollars, uh, 2500 US dollars per year in fertilizer cost, assuming, uh, I mean, it just depends what part of the world you are in and how much nitrogen uh, you need to put. So that's your baseline. 
for your lowest cost. Now, that may not be the way that you want to fertilize. You may say, well, I can't go out and spray every two weeks or every 10 days. I don't have enough labor for that. I don't have a sprayer. I need to put slow-release granular. Okay, so now you're going to be applying a much higher cost, slow-release granular, but you can justify that because of your saved labor cost because you don't like you don't have that labor you don't have that sprayer it's impossible for you to apply urea and potassium sulfate so you can easily justify using slow release granular and then if you can use premix or something and all these liquid products that you mix 10 products together in the tank that's going to cost maybe that's going to cost 20 times more or you know for the same amount of nitrogen maybe maybe it costs 10 times more but now you start looking at fifteen thousand twenty thousand thirty thousand dollar fertilizer budgets i'm not saying don't do that i'm just saying uh, well clearly if you're a professional golf course superintendent if you're spending an extra twenty thousand dollars beyond what you're uh, what you would be spending for applying urea or potassium sulfate i would think that you should be able to justify that in terms of reduced um pesticide use or improved turf grass performance or reductions in other um, you know, reductions in labor, reductions in mowing, whatever. So you should be able, for me, it's just a, it's like an economic thing. But what I've realized and why I'm mentioning this is some people apparently don't know that there's that baseline. And so it's just like, well, should I use the plant foods program or should I use the Griggs program or the Brandt program or the Emerald Isle program? And they don't know that, that what the baseline should be is urea and potassium sulfate. And then any additional cost, you justify it based on whatever benefits you're getting by applying plant foods instead of applying urea and, and potassium sulfate. And maybe, okay. maybe it's because your labor cost is so high and you, you, you can't dissolve urea because it, okay. yeah. you don't have that okay. time or labor. All right. So all right, l- let me, let me chime in here. So, so I think your last point is a good launching point. People I talk to about this say, you know what, Frank, um, it's a little tricky. It takes time to melt these down, the bags. It's a little extra effort. I just, the jug, it's easy. And let's be clear about this. Let's be very clear about this. We didn't find hardly any of these products that we tested in this trial or continue to be sold by all the companies that you sell that didn't give us high quality turf. We, you know, we had good turf. You can see in general, we had pretty good turf with most of these programs most of the time. So let's not disparage them that we are, you know, um, make, you know, we're not, we're not getting good quality with these products. So that's there. You're getting good performance and it seems a little bit easier uh, to pour it in than the rigmarole of weighing and melting as, as you know, you know, we still do, uh, you know, because we just do, we put the cloth in, we, we got the screen and we do the water and it takes a little bit longer and it is a lot easier to just pour a jug in and a lot to, again, one more uh, nod. These, these products are well formulated. Uh, you know, I know people who use them with, with great success. That said, what I'm seeing happen now, and I think probably the reason you're, we're having this conversation is much like what happened in 09, when all the money left the world, all of a sudden it made sense to be sustainable. And we began to ask questions about things we didn't ask questions about before and environmental stewardship and BMPs and things that I'd spent 20 years working on all of a sudden became in vogue. And we're seeing that now with fertilizer price pressures that people are experiencing. And what I think um, most superintendents, when you talk to them, don't think a lot about how much nutrient management programs cost for their putting greens. Number one, because it's the highest value area on their golf course. And number two, it's immaterial in a $1 million budget, you know, that I often interact with people. Now you get closer to the two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar $300,000 range. And, you know, you're a mom and pop operation and you got a lot of people who work for free golf. All of these things we say are necessities, right? They're absolute necessities, not you know, they're not necessities because a lot of the guys I visit, Micah, don't get paid to save money. They get paid to produce high quality playing conditions for memberships that are discriminating. And so that doesn't make sense to think about price when performance is what matters. And this stuff works nice and easy. 
And so let I think there's an explanation for it. And I think the reason we're examining it, I think we're going to see this with seed in the next few years as seed prices rise and and quality might be questionable um, and demand and, and supply will be diminished. Um, we're going to see this same question come up with seed as we're seeing now. And, and, and I think soon we're going to see it about and you hear it coming for water. You see it happening for labor. All of these things are questions around the same idea. We're examining things that are routine now that you and I explored 20 years ago with stupid potassium and soil testing. You're seeing that happening over and over again. And this is one example of it. Well, thank you. Thank you, Frank. I appreciate and I agree with you. For the high-end places, they it's, it's not an issue. And I've been surprised the inquiries that I get, um, I think it's sometimes it's from municipal places. So it's low end. Now, some people at the low end, they already know this, but there's people throughout the industry that don't know this. Mm-hmm. And, and it may just be a very small percentage. It probably is. I think a lot of people know that you can take urea and that it is 46% nitrogen. So if you take one pound of urea, it has... Uh, 0.46 pounds of nitrogen in it. And then if you spread that out over a certain area, that's your nitrogen rate and it dissolves in water in about 30 seconds. So you're talking about it being complicated to dissolve. The, yeah, the potassium's a little bit higher, uh, a little bit slower to dissolve. But as you know, a lot of places don't need to put that very often and don't need to put very much of it. So for me, I look at it and I'm like, my personal preference of course, it's not to put what's in a jug because, as you know, also from testing all those at the lab, there's a lot of stuff in those products that's not on the label and and specifically really high levels of sodium in some of these. So some people might be thinking that they're applying a premium product and and it like I'm just a little bit concerned about what's in that jug myself. Now, that's a, just my personal that's my personal feeling. I'm not concerned if I get urea, I'm pretty sure that I know exactly what it is. I know what's in the water and I know exactly what I'm applying and I know the exact rate. And for me, that gives me more control, but I understand people are comfortable with the stuff that's pre-mixed and they are high quality. And, and, but it's, we also found in that study and you can find in those supplemental tables that are in the, uh, uh, that are no longer online, but there's some floating around because it was once there on the GCSA website. Um, what some of the extra, uh, maybe arsenic, various, <laughs> various heavy metals. Yeah. Now let me say, right. You know, this is 20 years ago, right? So almost all of these, well, I shouldn't say all, but a significant number of these products are still on the market. Mm-hmm. So presumably the things that are in there, there's no evidence that at least no one studied it to know if they're causing any problems, um, including uh, so- sodium issues, right? Um, but so I, I think it's important to, to say that. I, I don't, I don't want to get in any more trouble disparaging people. You know, companies, <laughs> I buried this thing 20 years ago. Thank you very much. Yeah. And, and what it did, you know, and you know from working with me, m- my approach has always been sort of, you know, try it, learn it, and then move on and try to find the next thing. And I got to tell you, Micah, you know, you left and then Moody came and we did a little bit more. And I'm like, I don't need to study nutrient management anymore. It's not interesting to me. (laughs) I agree. Look look at the way Doug studies it. Look at our pal Doug. Look at the way he studies it. You know how he studies it? He does nothing. And then he puts on two rates of things over 10 years and that's he's doing his own little Rothamsted thing there that's going to be highlighted i think uh, next week at the field day um, it's it's at, very at interesting i had i've had some good conversations with him recently about that and i think it's it's wonderful what he's doing and i i apologize for bringing up this old miserable <laughs> experiment um and i you know i i didn't i don't think i enjoyed it any I didn't enjoy it very much, but the take home point was this is actually possible. So if you want something that is good quality, if you want to, if you want to save money, you can, you can, uh, do that. And, uh, that the reason for me bringing it up is, 
to, and, and I think Beth Gertal had a greenhouse study that I'm going to look up where she also compared uh, a bunch of fertilizers. I think that was in applied turf grass science. So maybe I can uh, check Beth's study. And I think that also had a urea as a control that was also like equivalent with everything else. A lot of people have done this. I think there've been a couple of studies, even where they, you know, um, um, uh, standardized the nitrogen rates, right? I think there are a, a couple of studies out there and, and listen, <laughs> um, it's really nice when you do studies that are great fun and enjoyable, but I, I, I did this work because like you are experiencing now as the New York state extension turf grass specialist, everybody and their brother was asking me about this stuff. And I, at the time, no one knew anything about these sorts of things. There were, it wasn't that we had this long history of mainstream companies that were selling pre-mixed liquid fertilizers. It wasn't really as big uh, as it was about to get. And I think it's, as I said earlier, because of the amount of money golf courses had at their disposal to spend. And these products were easy and they worked pretty good. So as I've always felt, and I know my colleagues uh, in extension around the country feel the same way. Our job is to, you know, support the turf grass managers in our state. And my approach was always to be more sustainable. It's very simple. You just have to use less of everything. <laughs> if you can use, if you can find the optimum uh, levels of all of these things, and I think I got to be careful. I don't mean less. I, I mean, optimized. Doug, Doug clears me up on that. But for sure, one of the things our data has shown is the more land you manage and the more intensely you manage it, the less sustainable you are. The less land you manage, the less intensively you manage it, the more sustainable you are. So this was really one of the themes of, of uh, you know, that particular time in my career, but my entire career, as you know. I'm going to. Yes, Frank. And I appreciate your time. I, I know you have to get going, so I'm not going to take up too much more of your time. But I've also uh, read a couple of your articles that you wrote in the early 90s and then one in 2000 that I came across a shortcut um, that I'm not I'm, I'm going to do a blog post about it uh, because okay. you said and this is about core cultivation. And it's a it's a 2000 article. It was 22 years ago you wrote this. And you're saying things that sound like uh, we're talking today, and it's been 22 years and nothing's changed. I'm going to bring that up. If uh, I'm going to bring that up pretty soon and ask people, here's the quote, who said this and when? And see if people can guess how long ago these questions were asked. Um, so anyway, that's a, a preview of some upcoming stuff. Maybe you can come on the show. And I just want to say one more thing. Uh, I wish you'd go and be a guest on the Talking Greenkeeper with Joe Galati. I think you've got an open invitation. What's up with that? I, mean, <laughs> I don't have that kind of time. If you notice the podcast I do, it's 30, 40 minutes, boom, boom, go. You know from working with me, I don't sit around and talk to anybody for that long. Never mind. I mean, maybe on a Friday afternoon with you in the early 2000s over a beer, we did that. But if, if Joe wants to get me on, he better be prepared for a 25, 30 minute conversation because I'm not yakking for two hours with you guys. OK, well, he's if you listen to his show recently, it's generally about an hour and 15 minutes uh, too or long. something too long. I don't have Maybe. that much to say. I don't actually have that much to say at the end of the day. <laughs> you know why? Because you stumbled on it. I've been saying shit for 30 years. No one listens. So I must really suck at this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I think you're an excellent communicator. But uh, yeah, I don't know what it takes for ideas to stick and to, uh, m yeah, to make their way to spread and to stick. That's that's uh, something listen, interesting. If you're, if you're going to take up the cultivation topic, you're in the mood for these controversial topics, I can tell. If you're going to take these things up, right? I'm ha I mean, the nutritional one, I feel in both of these cases, especially in the case of cultivation, I'm not a scholar in, in this area. In fact, I was trained as a plant ecologist, plant anatomist, weed scientist, not as a soil scientist. So I, yeah, there you go. You <laughs> ever right. read? That's what I'm reading now. The nature of yeah. plant communities. That's uh, a great Tom, book. Tom Cook recommended that. So 
I'm, As you know, I'm me. a devotee of, of, <laughs> of, of Emeritus Professor Cook. And so when you take up the cultivation exercise, the person to take that uh, question up with, with is, is my longtime colleague, um, Rock Aswa from, from Nebraska. Because I shot my mouth off, as you will show soon, and he went and studied it, right? Now, since no one will watch this, Rock had a nice little pipeline to some USGA money that I didn't have. So it was a lot easier for him. And that's okay. You know, USGA, you know, I I was really pleased and they've done this a lot, sort of targeted funding. I I think they should do that. That's really good. When you know someone's really good at something, don't waste their time making them write a grant. Just say, here's the money. Let's work on what you want to study and then go study it. I don't oppose that. And I think that's what happened here. And his work we used to argue about years and years ago. And it, two things I said to him, don't cultivate as much and make a hole and it doesn't matter or top dress and it doesn't matter. And those things came true. And I used to shoot my mouth, stop soil testing. All it's doing is make you buy more fertilizer. And I was right about that too. So you can get the three of us on here and I can tell them I told you so a few times. And I really that would be, that. that would be awesome. Yeah. I, was, I should have rock on to talk about your comments from 22 years ago. And then we'll have you on too, to talk about what we're going to do for the next 20 years. Oh, well, you should have him on. You should have us on together so he can call me an asshole to my face. I, I can, I can do that. I, I can have with this software, I can have, well, we could do a live stream, but yeah, we can have nine guests, I think, nine or 10 guests, which that would be chaotic. Um, but anyway, Frank, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. Is there anything else you'd like to say before I let you go? Uh, um, I'm hoping this actually doesn't get... <laughs> I'm hoping that we have to redo this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can tell me that after I sign off. But I don't want to edit it. So, uh, but yeah, I can, I can, I can edit it. Anyway, listen. As you know from spending some time with me a number of years ago, I'm always up for a lively conversation uh, with smart people who don't take themselves too serious. And so, um, I, I appreciated working with you and a lot of the folks I worked with over the years. Um, So I'm always happy to have these chats when it makes sense, but I'm not doing it for an hour and 15 minutes. That's well, we've been on for 42 minutes, Frank. So thank you so much. I appreciate your insight. And, uh, I think if anybody doesn't know that you can use urea, uh, or if you do know, and you think that everybody does know, I'm really interested to hear that. Um, because Frank thinks everybody knows. I think there's some people that don't quite realize it. I'm, I'm really interested to know what people know and don't know. So let us know. All right, Frank, thanks. I'm going to sign off and uh, turn the music up and say, uh, I appreciate everybody listening from Yantikau, Thailand for ATC. I'm Michael Woods. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>